Well, I was just telling Estelle that I have about 20 pages of notes, so get comfortable. Um, although certainly more than half of that is a single space 10 point font CV of hers, so let's make no mistake. Um, it's a great honor to be here, and it is true I did call as soon as I saw that Professor Friedman was going to be coming to campus and ask if I could do this. Um, and I'm going to start with a story, and every time I see the name Estelle Friedman or read it, um, this story comes to mind. So about, well, almost 20 years ago, uh, when I was casting about at the University of Michigan looking for an undergraduate thesis advisor, um, I had already chosen the topic of doing a gendered study of the incarceration of women in the state of Michigan, a project that I had been able to get involved with through activism, and went, as one dutifully did at that time, to the history department, though I was in American cultures, I was referred to historians and sat down and spelled out my approach and was looked at fairly quizzically in a way that I think was unfortunately too familiar even then for many of us, um, and got the response, well, of course women's prisons were gendered. They were for women. <laughs> and chagrined, unable to match my uh, uh, strength of feeling with an argument to muster there in that room, I left and, and thought I was going to kind of hang around feeling foolish and like I was out of step with how people really think and that I wasn't making any sense. Uh, when someone referred to me a scholar who I would never have known to work with, uh, somebody who was trained as an historian of modern European military history, a man um, whose office hours I visited and he listened to my ideas and listened and in his very deep Georgian Southern accent, this is Charlie Bright for those of you who hadn't guessed from University of Michigan, uh, said to me, well of course you're gonna start with Estelle Friedman. <laughs> and the greatest thing was, of course, that he said Estelle Friedman. <laughs> so to this day, I think her name is not Estelle, but Estelle. Um, but then I immediately went to and discovered a lifelong intellectual love affair with this scholar, starting with her 1981 book published by the University of Michigan Press, Their Sisters Keepers, Women's Prison Reform in America, 1830 to 1930. Um, and I've actually recently co-authored a book with a with a scholar on uh, the question of racial management in the workplace that actually uses that exact same pairing of dates, 1830 as 1930, um, which I hadn't actually realized till I'd gone back to look over her CV and putting my notes together, those specifics. So I think it's stuck in my craw in ways much more um, than the argument of the book, um, which was enormously important too. A self renew was the first historian who proved to me that you could care about theory and critical thinking and be engaged with ideas and even ideals, ideology, activism, um, and take seriously the archive and take seriously the methodology of history. Um, so that book was the first introduction to that way of studying history, um, but also to the idea that within a study of what at that time would have been called women's history, uh, Estelle was able to make very clear through the archive, through the actual narrative evidence of women in prison and their keepers, that not all women were constructed the same in US society and that not all expectations for what women should be or do um, <clears throat> came out of the same groundings and race and class and dare we say at that point even gender uh, expectations in society. So that was a great thrilling revelation for me. In preparing for this, I just want to say one last thing, <clears throat> which is that Bitch Magazine does a column that some of you may see in which they ask prominent feminists to talk about what the most important book was that they can remember, sort of what was the you know, book that was rocked their world, I think is the phrase that they use. And they recently, on the occasion of the publication of her new book, asked Estelle to write one of these columns. She chose to write about uh, the experience for her in reading uh, Susan Brown Miller's Against Our Will uh, in 1975. I think the book was, pu not sure, publication date, published in 75, and, and Estelle describes the experience of reading that text um, and engaging with the uh, problematic, then very important in the creation of feminist theory and uh, anti-sexist, anti-misogynist activism uh, gauging with imp the problem of rape um, and its uh, not just reality, 
as a tool of power in, that affected so many women, but also as a tool of power that shaped other um, discursive realities. And I encourage all of you to read that. If in my 20 page of notes, I actually have the entire text here, but I won't be reading it for due reasons of time. So just to say, it's a thrill for me to be able to be here and for all of us on the occasion um, to hear Estelle talk about this important new work. And I would say, coming in and seeing the posters with the word rape on them, how strangely not so common it is to see that word on the walls of posters on college campuses as it was when I started out as a feminist, as an undergraduate. Um, that word was more frequently evoked and invoked, um, not just as because we didn't have other words that described the broader complexity of violence and sexual violence that people of all genders face, um, but also that um, in a certain way we've moved away um, because of our, quote, successes from looking at some of maybe the more what would be considered foundational or traditional questions that feminists took on in US history. So it's a great pleasure to have this chance to go backward and to go forward with one of our most important and prolific scholars. So please welcome Estelle Friedman. Thank you to the Women's Center for uh, allowing me to come and speak. And thank you to all the students who are here. It's a delight to see you in a room in which I have many fond memories of uh, sitting in classes, as I do in the Women's Center, which at the time I was here was a seminar room where I had many classes that I remember very fondly. I want to say um, one thing before I begin my talk, and that is to acknowledge that some of the issues that are raised by the subject of sexual violence can be very sensitive personally and politically for many of us. And I just hope that my work can provide useful historical perspectives on what we realize are persistent problems in our own time. As many of you may know, the redefinition of rape has been much in the news of late. Indeed, as I was finishing redefining rape, I was struck by what seemed like an escalation of media attention to the politics of sexual violence. From, for example, the unfortunate phrase legitimate rape deployed in, unsuccessfully in the 2012 electoral campaign to justify limitations on abortion, uh, to exposés of the practice of, again, quote, rehabilitative rape against lesbians in South Africa, to the revision just last year of the definition of rape that had been used since 1927 by the Federal Bureau of Investigation Uniform Crime Reports, which now include any form of forced sexual penetration of a man or a woman, as well as, quote, non-forcible rape. I, I suspect that we are living in a moment of particularly intense scrutiny of the legal and cultural meaning of sexual violence. But challenging the definition of rape indeed has a long history in the United States, one that I think has left significant legacies for the way that we understand the subject today. And so tonight, I want to recount that history with a focus on the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a time when both women's rights and racial justice advocates contested the narrow understanding of rape at the time as a brutal attack on a chaste, unmarried white woman by a stranger, typically portrayed as an African-American male. In narrating efforts to expand on the meaning of rape, I'm going to highlight three key points that run throughout my book. First, the historical fluidity of the very concept of rape. Second, its relationship to citizenship. And third, the particular historical context in which legal changes occurred, as well as their limits. And I'll say a word about each of those points before I get into my historical narrative. My first point, the fluidity of the definition or the meaning of rape may seem obvious to historians who are here, but I think it's worth reiterating that rape is a highly malleable category in law and in culture. Different societies determine which non-consensual sexual acts to condone, which ones to criminalize, and how forcefully to prosecute the latter. 
Now, definitions have changed over the course of American history, but the powerful legacies of earlier constructions of rape continue to influence law and practice for generations. Just for the record, I should say that the Anglo-American definition of rape in the 19th century was the carnal knowledge of a woman when achieved by force and against her will by a man other than her husband. For a child under the age of 10, the law did not require force or in principle raise the question of consent. Over that age, violent physical force and physical proof of resistance were critical to proving rape in court, as was the prior chastity of the accuser. In the American context, rape law exempted not only marital, but also master-slave relations. And even after emancipation, the presumption that black women could not be raped persisted. There's a corollary I want to note to this point about the fluidity of the meaning of rape. And that is the influence of structures of privilege in revising the definition and prosecution of this crime. Who lived in fear of being raped? And who lived in fear of being accused depended heavily on social hierarchies, most clearly of race and gender, but also related to age and to ethnicity. For example, from the late 18th to the late 19th centuries, the dominant cultural understanding of which men posed the threat of sexual assault changed from Indians to white desperados and tramps to southern black men. And although the legal definition remained narrowly heterosexual, by the early 20th century, new immigrants and homosexual men came to be seen as sexual threats to boys. Each of these constructions deflected attention away from sexual crimes committed by elite heterosexual white men. My second and related theme that's central to the analytic framework of the book Redefining Rape is that the changing definition and prosecution of rape in American history has been critical to the construction of citizenship. That is, who was to be included in and who excluded from privileges and obligations such as voting, jury service, and office holding, as well as access to due process of law. On a practical level, the exclusion of women African Americans and certain immigrants from voting, lawmaking, and courtrooms excluded as jurors, as lawyers, as judges, and sometimes excluded even as observers, contributed to the immunities enjoyed by white men who seduced, harassed, or assaulted women of any race. On a rhetorical level, the constructions of black women as always consenting, white women as duplicitous, and black men as constant sexual threats, all justified the very limitations on citizenship that reinforced white men's sexual and political privileges. In, in short, our understandings of sexual assault contribute to the boundaries placed upon rights, reinforcing the economic inequalities that these boundaries sustain. My third theme concerns why certain groups contested the meaning of sexual violence when they did and to what ends. My book identifies a series of challenges to the dominant definitions of rape that I've been describing. Challenges particularly made by white women and African American women and men in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a time when each of these groups mobilized for inclusion as full citizens. They formed no unified movement, however, for racially parallel rather than cooperative campaigns characterized this political landscape until the mid-20th century. These political actors employed a range of strategies available to disenfranchised interest groups. They relied on the media. They wrote petitions to legislators. They, uh, found le they used legal advocacy. And they sought more powerful allies all to contest the dominant understanding of sexual violence. Now, there were other groups who were disadvantaged by rape law and its prosecution. But in this period, women's rights and racial justice activists created a counter discourse 
and sought legal change. At times, some of them succeeded in revising either legal or cultural definitions of rape, but usually with mixed results. As I'll illustrate with three examples from my book concerning first women's rights, then racial justice, and then a constellation of issues around child saving. The earliest critiques that I found of female sexual vulnerability illustrate, I think, both the political insights and the political limitations of white women's efforts to expand the definition of rape beyond the scenario of the violent attack by a stranger. And they took several forms. Uh, in the antebellum pre-Civil War decades, northern moral reformers targeted men who seduced single female acquaintances and then did not marry them. After the Civil War, suffragists decried both rape and the double standard of criminal justice. Uh, they demanded enfranchisement and jury duty for women in order to ensure fair prosecution in rape cases. In the late 19th century, radical free lovers first articulated a woman's right to refuse marital sex. By the turn of the 20th century, suffragists uh, rallied behind statutory rape reform, that is to increase the age below which a young woman or girl could not legally consent to sex, to raise it above the common law standard of 10 years. Each of these complaints targeted white men's sexual privileges, but none of them questioned the concurrent racialization of rape. White women began to rethink the requirements of force and resistance in the prosecution of rape within the context of heightened attention to female virtue at a time when a chaste reputation was becoming requisite for a middle class woman to be able to marry, to raise virtuous children, to foster morality within her husband. If sullied through sexual relations before marriage, she suffered a loss of honor that could come at the economic cost of not being able to marry, of being dependent on her family, or becoming wage earning in a life that moralists feared would devolve into prostitution. So chastity became a survival strategy for those women who embraced the middle class ideal, and seduction represented a threat to maintaining it. In the 1840s, moral reformers intent on staunching the spread of prostitution began to petition state legislatures to increase the penalties for seduction. They railed against the, quote, licentious man, quote, who persuaded or coerced a woman to consent to sex outside of marriage, typically by a false promise of marriage, uh, but also through certain deceptions such as a drugged drink and then left her to pay the full cost of a sullied reputation or an out of wedlock birth. Civil statutes already provided the remedy of financial compensation to the woman's family uh, if she had been seduced and abandoned. And these civil statutes also allowed the accused man to escape the fines by agreeing to what the feminist Mary Wollstonecraft referred to as, quote, a left-handed marriage, that is, if the man married the woman who he had coerced, he wouldn't have to pay the fines. In some cases, though, seduction represented what is known as a legal fiction that stood for the act of forcible sex, with plaintiffs and lawyers agreeing to file a civil seduction suit rather than a criminal rape complaint. Given the often thin line between consent and coercion and the reluctance of juries to convict men of rape, especially with acquaintances, Successful seduction suits offered a legal tool that warned men that they might not be able to get away with coercing or assaulting acquaintances. Moral reformers wanted legislatures to take these acts more seriously, and in the 1840s, they began to petition for the criminalization of seduction, making it a criminal and not just a civil offense. By 1900, over one half of the states had added criminal penalties of imprisonment along with fines. The language of the New York State Bill illustrates the recognition that seduction applied to women who were, in their terms, quote, compelled to yield to superior brute force, quote. So a woman might say yes or give up fighting, and it would be called seduction. Anti-seduction laws provided some legal leverage when male acquaintances coerced or assaulted single white women. 
but they fortified a gender ideology that defined women by their purity because the laws required typically that the accuser be chaste, have not had had any sexual relations before. Criminal seduction laws could reinforce racial as well as gender ideologies. They applied almost entirely to white women, given the stereotypes at the time about black female immorality. And um, in that way, the statutes contributed to the racialization of rape. Further in that vein, white men accused of rape were more likely to be charged either with attempted rape or criminal seduction. These are terms that could obscure the use of force. And if convicted, these white men served relatively short prison terms. In contrast, the crime of coercive violent sex was increasingly associated with black men who faced long prison terms, execution, and by the late 19th century, the threat of lynching. After the Civil War, neither moral reformers nor suffragists, even former abolitionists, addressed the growing racialization of rape and lynching. But the sexual abuse of white women and the double standards perpetuated by the courts during rape trials did provide grist for the suffragist mill. As the title of one article in the Woman's Journal explained, quote, women's deprivation of rights, the source of men's crimes. Only full citizenship, the paper repeatedly insisted, would prevent the physical and sexual violence that Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell cataloged in their newspaper column that was titled Crimes Against Women. According to Stone, quote, the only way to have these crimes against women punished as they deserve is to have women share the lawmaking power. Along with the vote, female jury service would achieve fairer treatment of women in court. Women alone are the peers of women, insisted a writer in another suffragist paper, alluding to, I quote, certain criminal proceedings, quote, in which, quote, women alone can understand what has been committed and what resisted. And that whole phrase is a euphemism, of course, for rape. Although they sought equal rights in the public realm, most 19th century suffragists avoided the subject of the marital exemption in rape law. Now, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone occasionally referred to the problem of sexual abuse within marriage, but only the radical free lovers publicly denounced a husband's right to have sex with a non-consenting wife. Because of this right, Virginia Woodhull, uh, excuse me, Victoria Woodhull referred to marriage as a form of sexual slavery. In the anarchist journal Liberty, a woman named Lillian Harmon questioned the limitation of rape laws by pointing out, and I quote, a husband can go to the brothel and commit a crime which will, if he is prosecuted, send him to the penitentiary. But if he comes home the same night and commits the same crime on his wife, he will not be troubled by the law. Some free lovers explicitly linked marital rape with limitations on female citizenship. Give us a hand at lawmaking, a married woman wrote in 1886, welcoming, quote, an opportunity to wipe from the statute books such infamous laws as the one that a married man cannot rape his wife, quote. Free lovers differed with suffragists over the um, revision of statutory rape laws, a major goal of temperance and social purity advocates at the end of the 19th century. Uh, increasing the age of consent above the common law threshold of 10 years, they argued, would make it easier to prosecute men who recruited young women into prostitution and to protect girls from sexual ruin. At a time when most women could not vote, run for office, or serve on juries, they succeeded in convincing male legislators in most states to expand the definition of underage sex. So by 1920, almost every state had raised the age of consent to between 16 and 18 years old. Like anti-seduction laws, the stricter statutory rape laws provided greater courtroom leverage for some young women, and most suffragists championed the reform. But the response of free lovers illustrates the tension between protective and empowering strategies in these first anti-rape movements, that is, state protection as opposed to women's empowerment. Lillian Harmon, the anarchist, 
believed that the laws constituted, in her words, the surrender of the selfhood of the young women of America. Rather than seeking protection by the state, she invoked her right, quote, to profit by my mistakes, quote. After a woman reached the age of puberty, she believed sexual relationships should not be criminalized. Harmon shared with suffragists and social purists a rejection of sexual violence. Uh, and she, too, believed that there should be a single standard of morality, the same for men and women. But for her, she wanted to extend to women the sexual liberties enjoyed by men. In her words, again, quote, not by making the man a slave with woman, but by making woman free with man. Not by leveling down, but by leveling up. In the 19th century, Lillian Harmons was a rare female voice critical of the underlying ideology of female purity in the anti-seduction and age of consent laws. But in the early 20th century, elements of her vision of sexual self-sovereignty and of gender-neutral sexual mores gained traction. By the 1920s, both working and middle-class young women sought sexual adventures. Jurists and doctors chafed against the protective laws, and they saw them as unfairly punishing young men. And some post-suffrage feminists agreed with them. Along with shedding state protection, however, modern young women gained reputations as flirts and as seducers themselves. In the process, those who did report incest, harassment, or assault often faced the kinds of strict scrutiny and disbelief that had motivated the earliest reformers to strengthen legal protections. By the mid-20th century, most calls to reform rape laws concentrated on protecting men from duplicitous and hysterical women. Only the revival of feminism after the 1960s reversed this direction to put women's experience at the center of a political analysis of rape. White women tried to redefine rape to include nonviolent and coercive relationships with acquaintances. But black women and men, my second example, faced far greater challenges in undermining the racial construction of sexual violence. So deeply had the racialization of rape taken hold in American law and culture, certainly by the late 19th century. Views that black women had no moral virtue to defend and that black men posed a constant threat to white women's purity justified their exclusion from full citizenship after emancipation. The image of the rapist as an aggressive black man had originated much earlier in the colonial era. For example, as early as 1765, an index to the laws of Maryland read, quote, rape, see Negroes. Though not yet considered a threat to all white women, African American men were more likely to be convicted and executed when accused of rape than were white men. And but, yeah, the notion of rape as what was called, quote, the Negro crime, perpetuated against white women, persisted throughout the 19th century, reinforced by press accounts. And as historian Hannah Rosen has shown, after emancipation, rape served as a weapon of terror used to assert white male supremacy and specifically to punish women whose male kin voted Republican during Reconstruction. Although Southern black women reported assaults to the Freedmen's Bureau and accused both white and black men of rape, their efforts were undercut by disenfranchisement, Jim Crow segregation, and the terror of lynching. Lynching rested in large part on the escalating myth that free black men threatened white women's safety and honor, a fear that intensified after slavery no longer ensured white dominance. Between the 1880s and the 1930s, lynching claimed the lives of thousands of black men and women. W.E.B. Du Bois, the African-American scholar, captured the centrality of sexual assault to the reestablishment of white supremacy in the South when he later wrote, the charge of rape against colored Americans was invented by the white South after Reconstruction to excuse mob violence and then became the recognized method of re-enslaving blacks. Even though most lynchings had nothing to do with sexual assault, invoking the specter of interracial rape 
help protect white mobs from criticism while simultaneously portraying black men as incapable of the rationality and moral control required of citizens. Now, in my book, I devote considerable attention to efforts to defend black men from false rape accusations. But this evening, I want to focus on a parallel argument that black women deserve justice when assaulted by white men. Identifying white men as rapists became a key strategy in the anti-lynching movement that gathered momentum during the early decades of the Great Migration in the early 20th century. Naming black women as victims of interracial rape served a dual purpose of undermining one of the justifications for lynching, that really lynching was the Negro crime, uh, and also providing justice for those white men who assaulted black women, and both of these efforts advanced the African-American quest for political rights. <coughs> Redefining rape to include black victims was a daunting task at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, in the decade before she became the leading African-American critic of lynching, the journalist Ida B. Wells explained, and I quote, among the many things that have transpired to dishearten the Negroes in their effort to attain a level in the status of civilized races, has been the wholesale contemptuous defamation of their women, end of quote. Wells famously insisted that virtue knows no color line, and the northern black women's clubs that she helped inspire rejected the dominant white cultural belief that African American women willingly engaged in promiscuous sexual relations and thus could not be raped. In the 1890s, these club women initiated a quest for sexual respectability <clears throat> and uh, for a single standard of justice. A woman named Florida Ruffin Ridley wrote in the movement's journal, The Woman's Era, we read with horror of two different colored girls who have recently been horribly assaulted by white men in the South. We should regret any lynchings of the offenders by black men, but we shall not have occasion adding that should these offenders receive any punishment at all, it will be a marvel. Along with these black women's club members, the black press took a leading role in exposing the double standard of justice in rape cases. At a time when the majority of uh, reports of rape in white newspapers concerned uh, black interracial rape, uh, African American newspapers publicized the underreporting of white on black rape. The Baltimore Afro-American, for example, noted in big, bold-faced print, not a single daily paper has mentioned the rape of a 12-year-old colored girl by a white man, while every daily paper in the city carried black headlined news articles about the rape of a 16-year-old white girl by a colored man. The African-American press self-consciously attempted to compensate for this bias. White gentleman commits rape, the Chicago Defender headlined a 1911 article about a Portland, Oregon assault with the subhead, that's all right, it was on a colored girl, permitted by the United States government and the Confederacy. Underlining these reports was an unspoken complaint on the part of black men that they could not fully attain the status of manhood because they could not protect their women. No, quote, real man, one article about insults to black women explained, would stand for any such treatment to any woman. Reports of white men's attacks on black women, which pointed to both southern and northern assailants, regularly inverted the racial tropes that pervaded the white press. So instead of the Negro rapist, headlines followed the phrase white man with verbs such as charged, rapes, held, attempts, assaults. The lead to one report epitomized the message that, quote, the ability to rape and the desire to commit such an act is not copyrighted by any particular race. Uh, the African American press also monitored police and court procedures, foreshadowing the legal challenges that would become an important plank in the civil rights movement after the 1930s. The press complained about the unequal application of capital punishment for rape and pointed out what they called cases in contrast of unequal sentencing. 
Black journalists celebrated anything that unsettled the association of black men as rapists. It wasn't our race this time in beastly role, the Chicago Defender boasted in 1922, when two white men were jailed for the rape of a 12-year-old, quote, Negro girl in North Carolina. After World War I, the black press also targeted white men who were known as mashers. These were men who approached, insulted, and tried to pick up women in northern cities. Now, for over a decade, really from uh, about 1908 through World War I, uh, during this time, suffragists had been complaining about these white men who harassed white women. But just as the mainstream press lost interest in the masher story, the African-American press began to elaborate on the racial dynamics of street harassment, what we would today call street harassment, as part of their effort to redefine sexual assault to include black women as victims. Black women in the South had long endured sexual insults from white men as they traveled, but they had had little recourse for complaints. The Northern migration and the mounting political consciousness of the new Negro raised expectations that African-American women could move more safely in integrated space. So in the 1920s and 1930s, black papers targeted white men who sexually insulted or approached African-American women on the street. Writers in the Baltimore Afro-American often applied a derogatory slang for whites, referring to them as ofe mashers. Masher accounts in the black press often expressed admiration for working women who physically defended themselves, such as a plucky Miss Boyer who fought off a white masher when he tried to embrace her in the hotel elevator car that she was operating. When police arrested and courts convicted white men who harassed black women, the African-American press celebrated. Both the rhetoric in the press and the reports of court victories suggest that by the 1930s, a small wedge had appeared in the racialization of rape, allowing some black women to become believable victims and some white men to be punished for interracial rape, attempted rape, or harassment. Naming of these white assailants served the goals of the larger anti-lynching movement, simultaneously empowering African-American women's quest for sexual respectability and for sexual safety. The last example I want to share with you this evening, the identification of certain men as sexual threats to boys in the 20th century is less well known than the racialization of rape, but similarly contributed to contracting possibilities for citizenship. Concerns about the sexual vulnerability of boys merged within the complex uh, context of progressive era reform, which included child-saving impulses, immigration restriction, and the emergence of sexual liberalism. By recognizing boys as objects of sexual seduction or victims of assault, doctors, jurists, and social scientists contested the long-standing Anglo-American definition of rape as a heterosexual act. At the same time, sexually vulnerable children began to supplant adult women in the discourse on sexual assault while immigrants and homosexual men became increasingly associated with child predation. While African-American men were overrepresented in rape prosecutions, they were rarely charged with sodomy, perhaps because of the cultural association of black men with hypermasculinity rather than with effeminacy. Rather, certain foreign-born men became associated with perversion in the early 20th century, reflecting the nativist sentiments that contributed to the enactment of immigration restriction in the 1920s. After the 1930s, though, during a series of uh, panics over child sex murders, the newly emerging figure of the homosexual man began to replace the immigrant sodomite as the primary sexual peril for boys. Sodomy law was critical to this whole process, since rape law only covered heterosexual relations. Sodomy law had rarely been used to punish consensual relations in the 19th century. Uh, and sodomy statutes did allow the prosecution of non-consensual sexual acts, particularly if there was a use of force, um, and particularly if there had been a relationship between a man and a youth or boy. 
As historian Stephen Robertson has shown, sodomy law served as a kind of unofficial age of consent mechanism um, for male-male relations. At the turn of the 20th century, in the context of concerns about urban vice and the vulnerability of children, arrests for sodomy, particularly cases involving minors, increased markedly in most American cities, as did appellate sodomy cases. At first, the expanding discourse on sexual relations between men and boys often targeted certain recent immigrants. Now, I should say that the demonization of foreigners as sexually immoral has a long history. It had originally focused on women as potential prostitutes, uh, a rationale of the Page Act of 1875 that paved the way for the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act and then to later immigration restriction. Uh, because Americans uh, stereotyped Asian immigrant men as effeminate, they tended to view them as seducers and pimps rather than violent rapists. But concerns about immigrant immorality included same-sex relationships as well. In, on the West Coast, some nativists warned that the Chinese would bring, quote, paganism, incest, sodomy, quote, as well as miscegenation to America. In 1909, a California physician uh, who was treating several teenage boys for rectal gonorrhea blamed this condition on what he called sodomistic practices and claimed that, though once rare, end quote, since the influx of foreigners from those countries where unnatural practices are common, more cases are now seen. So uh, uh, this this um, tendency to attribute to immigrants a penchant for sexual perversion drew upon the ideas of early sexologists, such as um, Richard von Croft Ebbing, whose theory of racial degeneracy associated perversion with primitive races, the lower classes, and with poor immigrants. 19th century American newspapers had rarely reported sodomy cases. But in the early 20th century, during the progressive era, the press occasionally began to expose queer subcultures. For example, covering sex scandals like in the 1912 scandal in Portland, Oregon. As part of a crackdown there, dozens of predominantly white middle class men were arrested for sodomy. Um, many of them had socialized at private drag parties that were raided. Although the youngest of them was age 19, the press and the court highlighted the danger these men posed to youths. Some Oregon politicians called for harsh punishment, including the sterilization of perverts. One Portland resident suggested that authorities were being too lenient with these men, and in a letter to the editor of a local paper stated that, if these degenerating practices were committed by Greeks or Hindus, end quote, they, there would have been calls to drown them in the Willamette River. In fact, Greeks and Hindus were more likely to be seen as perverse male predators. Although Greek immigrants represented less than 1% of the population of Portland at this time, they appeared in over 11% of the arrests during the 1912 sex scandal. Authorities became particularly alarmed about what they called, quote, immoral boys who pander to the passions of vicious Greeks. This association could have formed because Mediterranean cultures allowed physical and some sexual contact among men, or because skewed sex ratios among primarily male immigrants from Greece and Italy, like those from China and South Asia, could encourage some same-sex relations. But whatever the source, the insinuation of perversity had serious implications, influencing eligibility for entry into the United States and ultimately the possibility of citizenship. In the early 20th century, as historian Margot Kennedy points out, sexual perversion itself was not an explicit basis for excluding immigrants. But officials found other reasons to deny entry to those they suspected. So if immigration officials detected what they called signs of arrested sexual development or defective genitalia, they might exclude an individual on the grounds that they were likely to become a public charge, regardless of their actual wage earning capacities. A doctor examining a young Greek man in 1912 warned against admitting those with deformed genitals because, quote, they may be sexual perverts. The 1911 U.S. Immigration Commission, uh, in its report on the traffic in women, called for stronger restrictions, quote, applied with even greater rigidity in the case of men, quote, and immigration restrictions uh, immigration 
officials lamented the fact that what they called moral perverts were not specifically excluded by the law. The uh, restrictive immigration legislation that took effect in the 1920s may have diffused some of these concerns. But beginning in the 1930s, a full-blown moral panic over the threat posed to children by adult men led to a spate of new laws and institutions to treat their uncontrolled desires. The ethnic child predator gave way to the sexual psychopath portrayed as a white man who needed psychiatric attention rather than prison. But the post, excuse me, by the post-World War II era, when gay male urban subcultures became more vibrant and more visible, the image of psychopathic homosexuals who threatened young boys helped fuel anti-gay hysteria and sent these men to psychiatric prisons with indeterminate sentences. This reconfiguration suggests, I think, how heavily the redrawing of boundaries in the name of protecting children depended on perceptions of larger social threats. Like the demonization of African American men as rapists, the association first of new immigrants and then of homosexuals with child abuse masked other forms of assault committed by native-born white men, including heterosexual rape and incest. This history helps explain why by the end of the century, for example, in response to Anita Bryant's Save the Children campaign of the 1970s, rejecting the association with child predators would become important to the gay rights movement. In surveying these examples of women's rights, racial justice, and child-saving influences on past redefinitions of rape, I hope that I have convinced you of the fluidity of the concept, its relationship to citizenship, and the complex legacies of any efforts at reform. In our own time, the term rape has been expanded further to include non-forcible as well as violent acts committed by and upon members of any gender or race, regardless of marital status. Men who once enjoyed immunity from prosecution by virtue of their status, such as clergy, teachers, or coaches, are now beginning to face closer scrutiny about their abuse of girls and boys, of young men and women. For all of these changes, though, earlier constructs remain deeply embedded in our culture, and the benefits of redefinitions are unequally distributed. The underreporting of rape, the racial profiling of perpetrators, the silencing of sexually abused children, and the victim blaming that attributes assaults to women's clothing or their past sexual histories persist today. Now, however, the protests waged by those once at the political margins seeking citizenship have turned into mainstream policy debates. The history I explore in redefining rape suggests to me that contestations over the meaning of sexual violence will continue as long as social inequalities, particularly those based on gender and race, continue to characterize American life. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so looking forward to clarifications, comments, and questions. I just took snippets from a book that is about many, many, many things and tried to give you the overall analytic framework, um, and I'd be happy to elaborate if there was anything that you need to know more about, um, or questions, and um, any thoughts? It sounds like we've come a long way since To Kill a Mockingbird, mm. but I'm wondering how far we've come since the recent uh, scandals at Horace Mann, an elite private school in New York City. Right. Can you elaborate on that, please? This is such a perfect example. I think you all heard the reference to the Horace Mann scandal. And, and may I add that there are, well, well, I'll say something about Horace Mann, and then I would like to expand. But it's such a perfect example of what I was saying about how when you target certain groups as the rapists, you are at the same time protecting the sexual privileges of other groups. So for generations and generations, there have been primarily white men in authority as teachers, again, as coaches, as priests, other clergy, who were not seen as possible predators. Uh, when you 
target, again, here, on homosexuals, immigrants, et cetera. And what we're seeing now, and I attribute this in many ways to feminism's opening up of what was once private into public discourse and contestation. We are now looking more closely and taking away some of those, not just veils of secrecy, but also some of the protections that certain groups have had. So we are redefining rape as an act that could be committed by anyone, not only by the traditional historical targets. But what I wanted to add to your good point about, and, and, and the larger point about elites, white men, people who were once um, sort of riding on a certain sexual privilege, um, I'm going to give you a, an anecdote about that too, uh, not just in public situations, but the, the, the silence around sexual abuse within families. One of the most chilling comments that I quote in the book has to do with a young, a young woman has accused an older man of assault, and I can't remember if it was an uncle or a family friend, and the doctor who's testifying the case says, it is impossible that this upstanding man assaulted this child because he's married and he has a sexual outlet, so there is no motive for him to abuse that child. You know, so these different covers that statuses that protected men. But when you brought up Horace Mann, I just wanted to say that there are other exposés that have been going on, uh, not among elites necessarily, um, but in uh, sort of, uh, I will just say it, colonial relations, if you will. I'm thinking about Native American reservations, Native American boarding schools, um, not just in the United States, but in Australia and Canada. And this is the, these exposés go back a decade or more um, but we are really only beginning to expand on them. Um, as some of you may know, there have been hearings recently in Congress about the sexual vulnerability of Native American girls and women and the lack of legal responsiveness, um, issues of jurisdiction, et cetera. So in a, in a range of school settings, there has been abuse of power. And what's so interesting about the private school situation is that um, there's been so much silence among those who have not had privilege and authority and that now we're even cracking where there is privilege, where there has been so much privilege. Okay. A lot of what you shed light on is this the continued social contra constructs that are still kind of embedded in our thinking about rape that you see still propagated in the media you know, the conflation of rape and sex or con consent and not consent. And so I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what you found in your research around changing definitions of the, like the, the cause of perpetration. So in other words, like you just mentioned that uh, the cause of perpetration in one case was, oh, well, he had a wife, so he had a sexual outlet, so he wouldn't have perpetrated. And I, and I find that these, these sorts of thinking still pervade. But, but there's so much more about the act of rape, and it's always conflated with sex still. So to give a sort of conceptual overview in terms of if I had to characterize different periods in American history in terms of why do men rape, you know, there's no answer to this question, but how people thought about it. In the um, early America, certainly in New England, uh, it would have been an issue of sin, right? Um, and I think that in the 19th century, to some extent, you begin to get some medicalization about sickness, but really that flourishes in the 20th century with psychiatric interpretations. But the point that I was making in my talk and I make in the book is that race comes to explain rape for Americans, that it's a racial characteristic that then masks all the other possibilities of power relations of, um, well, the, the fact that uh, the rape of black women as an assertion of white supremacy, for example, will not be named as such because you have characterized rape rather as a threat to white purity. So I would say overall, I think there's a shift as there is so much in American historical thinking from s ideas of sin to ideas of sort of it's in the body to ideas of it's in the mind. They're sick men, the psychopaths. Um, but race runs throughout all of that. You talked about the legal implications of rape, but what about the social? We have a situation in New York City just last Rosh Hashanah this past weekend where the woman who, the Satmir woman who spoke up in the trial that we had last year about Williamsburg and uh, in the synagogue that she went to for Rosh Hashanah, 
They stopped the services and refused to continue the services because she was there. She had to leave the synagogue. So what about the social thing? What is to be done in this very situation? We have a community that actually yeah. So um, otherwise. I'm not sure I can answer the what is to be done question, but <laughs> it's an important one and to, for all of us to think about. But I, I can say in, as a historian that um, I think the issue you're getting at is what kind of social support or lack of support is there for women to come forward? And it, again, I would say that there have been periods when there has been more social support uh, and they correlate highly with suffrage movement and second wave feminism. That periods when women are mobilizing and seeking empowerment they are more likely to come together in social movements to name sexual threats and to support the women who are naming them rather than in periods when women are afraid as individuals that they will lose privilege because of the approval of male power structures, then they're less likely to come together. So in terms of what is to be done, I think the more that women acknowledge to each other common vulnerabilities and the structural inequalities that underlie some of those vulnerabilities, the more likely they are to support each other. And the example that you're giving, I don't know if that is available, but we're talking about a highly patriarchal institution. Not all religious institutions would be as unsupportive. And in fact, there are some religious institutions that have really raised issues of, of, of well, not as much as they should have. Here's a what is to be done. Any of you involved in any religious institutions? Why aren't they raising issues of sexual violence and as an issue of social justice? You know, go back and deal with that. But I think that it, it correlates a lot with, um, with women's movements. Um, I alluded in my talk to the masher, and there's a chapter in the book called Smashing the Masher, which is about a whole movement during the progressive era I had never known about, nobody's ever written about before, that I discovered in my research of women talking about self-defense, about learning to fight back, about kicking butt if men come up to them on the streets, and then demanding that cities hire police women so that it was, they would really get some protection and give police women authority. And this movement is, um, has such parallels what would go on in the late 20th century in terms of it's not just that we're going to make women physically strong enough to defend themselves, but they will have an attitude walking down the street that men won't want to go near them because they will feel, I mean, they really are using this language. And that really fades away in the sort of post-suffrage, post-World War I era. And then you see it come back again much more strongly after the 19th, 60s, 1970s. So uh, that's one of my reasons for thinking that when women are mobilizing politically in other ways, they are also more likely to think about empowering women and not being dependent on men to protect them. I was just wondering uh, if you could talk about uh, the social dynamics of age that make rape contestable when it comes to young girls. Yes. Um, and why that is that, you know, it, our concept of adulthood is blurred when girls claim sexual assault and um, you know how it has to do with race and how it has to do with our concept of just when girls can become women and yes. when they can start to give consent. Mm -hmm. This is such a great question. I only regret that I can't speak for 50 minutes about it. You know, about professors ask a question and they go for 50 minutes. But um, there's a lot in the book about this question of age and the racial differences. And so one thing that's going on, as you could tell from the age of consent movement, that there's a sense that um, well, the discovery of adolescence in the late 19th, early 20th century, that there's this period of life, it's not childhood, it's not adulthood, we're gonna extend protection to these young, uh, young women, they're really called girls, um, and that the age at which uh, the state is going to protect girls is, is definitely increasing, and it's part of um, a change in which um, young people are going to school longer, they're dependent longer, perhaps they're gonna marry later, that there's a new period of life sort of in between, so that's, that's part of the context. One of the things, though, that I found in reading the newspaper accounts of rape and even quantifying some of these things was that over the late 19th century and into the early 20th century, the age of the, quote, victims, I tend to not use that word in the book, but let's say the press uses that word, is getting younger and younger. 
it's getting younger and younger. What does that tell us? It's saying that the way the press is defining rape in its coverage is more and more, you have to be younger and more innocent. Older women are considered more likely to be experienced sexually, which is going to exclude them from that definition of the chaste woman. And the, 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 I called it in one article the girling of rape, that you have to be younger and younger to be believable as an innocent victim. And here's the interesting thing. I actually looked at the stories about black girls and white girls. You had to be even younger if you were black. There's an age gap. It goes down for both. But your direction goes down for both. But a white girl at, say, 13 or 14 may still be believable as innocent. But for a black girl, uh, she has to be 10 or 11. Yeah, it, there's, there's a several year gap in that. Um, I won't go on a whole lot more about that, but um, why, why the vulnerability uh, is related, there's vulnerability in the family, there's vulnerability in schools, and then there's vulnerability as young women go into the wage force and are low paid, but dependent on their jobs, and very vulnerable to what we today would call sexual har harassment, but in some of the cases I've read are clearly assault. Um, Underlying, back to your earlier question about social, all, many of these, I would say, is the economic inequality that young girls and adult women face that made them more vulnerable and less, less empowered. I was just wondering, um, in your research and readings, periods of time when you said, like, during the suffrage movement and um, when women were beginning to realize what's going on in their lives that's not so great, women of privilege, was there writings about marital rape and um, what did they call it and how did, did it ever get to the level of courts and or social right. opinion, or what? So I mentioned in the talk that it was really only the radical free lovers in the 19th century who were naming rape as marriage. Um, the suffragists, who were already so unpopular for wanting women suffrage, were really afraid to touch marriage and be considered anti-marriage. Or there's a sort of this, the, the marital exemption rape law is one of the last vestiges of coverture of the man's rights over his wife, and they last very long. Um, as I say, the free lovers had a political analysis, and they believed that women should be able to refuse sex with their husbands. Nobody else was talking about it but them, and they get suppressed. Many of you probably know the story of Anthony Comstock and the suppression of obscenity, and the anarchist free lovers were big targets, and their publications get suppressed. Where it comes up again is in some marriage advice literature by the 1920s, uh, you get some suggestion that you know sex should always be mutual, but um, in the law, nobody's touching it. If a woman wants a divorce because she is being sexually abused by her husband, she can't get it on those grounds in, say, the early 20th century. She can go on the grounds of cruelty and then say the cruelty was, and from the studies of divorce cases, she had better show constant with physical bruises with all kinds of violence as it's not just I don't want to have sex and I have to have sex it has to really reach this high, very high standard and then it's not just because of rape it's not it's not called rape it's called just marital cruelty and she may not get the divorce there's plenty of cases where she gives the evidence and she doesn't get the divorce because the sanctity of marriage was considered so important it's really again, second wave feminism, 1970s, and then by the 1980s, that the term marital rape is even coined. So it's very, very recent. And I want to say 84, 86, that it really begins to, there may be one law in the 70s, and then the states start to pass laws. And even today, uh, marital rape is, uh, has a higher um, threshold. That it has to be pretty bad before you can call it rape in marriage. Yeah, it's not... Yeah, it's, it, th there's still um, disparities in terms of different kinds of rape. I'm fascinated by this phenomena that you've been touching on throughout your talk and that I think we're all aware of, of an increased recognition of rape as happening in, you know, not just and these stereotypes and conventions and talking about violence against children and within 
in between men and boys and et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm thinking about particularly like the Penn State case mm -hmm. and that place where we cross over from the importance of paying attention to and speaking about these truths to a somehow intensity of recognition of crimes against children and the predation, particularly by men against boys, that reinscribes a homophobic narrative and a and a a sickness of sexuality that is homophobic that has to do with that kind. And feminist legal scholars are trying to get at it by basically documenting that we have far more instances of repeat offending in domestic violence than we do in sexual offenses, pedophilia in particular. So this whole panic about sexual offenders being registered and being required to all these legal um, policing, surveilling activities, it sits complexly against this other spectrum of violence that is also gendered. So I'm wondering yeah. if you'll I would put like that into so the story. Actually, I'm, I'm gonna use that question not just about the issue of children, but to make a larger point that I think runs through this story that I really haven't addressed directly, but perhaps some of you uh, sense it. And that is throughout the history of redefining rape, there is a tension between expanding the definition beyond the very narrow one that I told you about to undermine the sexual vulnerability of, say, let's say women and children. A tension between that on the one hand and on the other hand, the protection of the rights of the accused. I think that's what you're getting at. And one lesson of this history is that we have to always be conscious whenever you're looking at one side of that tension to be very careful not to go all the way over. Not to over define rape in a way that, well, as it was in the 19th century, that you know we know who the rapists are. All black men are potential racists, that, and denying their 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 um, due process of law, lynching, et cetera. You know the, all of this. Um, at the same time, you don't want to go over. The history tells us you don't want to go over on the other side too far, which is that well, of course you know he was married or. Um, why would he want to do that? Or, but um, we really have to know the history of the uh, sexual history of the victim because it's not fair to the accused man. I mean, you can go, you have to keep both of those in play and look at it. And individual cases are always going to have a slightly different balance in formula. So I could not say universally that sex offender registries are bad. Although, I have to say at the same time that some people get caught up in moral panics around children who shouldn't be caught up in it. But if you talk to somebody whose children have been abused by someone who hasn't been registered, they're going to have a very different perspective. And, you know, you can keep what I, you know, keep going back and forth on race, on children, on all kinds of things, keeping in mind the rights of the accused and the rights of the accuser and not limiting them categorically by the race or the gender, but really asking what is fair in this case. Thank you. Thank you.